Um, my name is Adam Tooze of Columbia University, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you today to this panel. Uh, it's the first of a mini-series uh, that my co-conspirators, Michael Mazar, Philip Shelter-Jones of WF, WF and I have put together. The second one to, is tomorrow. It's the one chaired by Martin Wolf on uh, When Orders Break. Um, but we have today an absolutely fantastic panel uh, of contributors. Um, Sitting next to me, uh, Gita Gopinath, the uh, newly appointed uh, chief economist of the IMF. Uh, Gita is uh, the John Swanstra Professor of International Studies and Economics at Harvard. Um, and her research focuses uh, on the bit I think that's attracted perhaps the most uh, 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 attention at least is the, the work that's focused on the constituent elements and the drivers of the dollar uh, as a global currency, which could not be a more uh, important topic for us. Uh, next to her is Professor uh, Zhang Beibei, uh, the dean of uh, the China Institute at Fudan University, uh, known to all of you, I'm sure, as an author of key texts on the question of China's rise and its position in the world. Um, he's been a visiting fellow at uh, Oxford and uh, has taught at the Geneva School of Diplomacy and International Relations. And uh, last, but absolutely not least, and indeed our co-inspirer of today's panel, uh, Michael J. Mazar, uh, senior political uh, scientist at RAND. Uh, he's taught at Georgetown, served as dean uh, at the War College, and uh, a president of the Henry L. Stimson Center. So we have an extraordinary uh, panel. Without further ado, I'll ask Michael to kick things off uh, with some remarks setting the stage. Each one of these panels will have a kind of combination of a historical component, a global component, a contemporary element. Then I'll ask our co-panelists to respond briefly to his remarks. We'll go back and forth and then open the floor up to questions from you. We'll aim to finish punctually at 11 o'clock so that you can all move on into the rest of rest of your Davos morning. But Michael, if you want to take <clears throat> Thank the, you very take much. So my yeah. job here is just to take a few minutes to get the panel started with some comments on this. Uh, thank you for joining us to talk about this impossibly broad and complex topic. The, one of the major themes, if not the major theme of this year's uh, forum is that the current version of globalization, however we define it, is in some ways unsustainable. It's unsustainable ecologically, it's unsustainable socially, in terms of uh, diversity, justice, a variety of, of areas. And, and this call for a thinking about a globalization 4.0 and what it might look like can be informed by how we got to this point, the modern history of globalization. How did we come to this era? Now, because this topic is so big, um, I am going to focus on a couple of particular aspects of it. And then in the discussion and in the question and answer, we can broaden if you want. But I'm going to focus on uh, the governance challenges the issue of the building of an international order in a globalization era, and the geopolitical components of that, which I think together are one of the, the critical challenges we face in trying to build uh, a new form of global order. And as a preview, uh, my bottom line is a little daunting. If history is any guide, we are arriving at uh, a very perilous juncture in the history of this post-war, latest post-war order, uh, one that potentially has very significant geopolitical risks if we are to take history as any guide. So we all know broadly what we think of as globalization. I think it's important to think of it as a system, as the system of an integrating world across all of these different areas of economy, environment, culture, geopolitically. As the system becomes more integrated, it creates a demand for governance, for institutions, rules, and norms to run the increasingly integrated system, in part because, as I will emphasize in a minute, one of the implications of this process is that the fundamental source of human collective identity, the nation state, can no longer in a globalizing era fulfill the economic or political promises that it makes to its citizens on its own. And therefore, nations have to turn to an increasingly integrated system in order to get what they need. So we have seen three sort of stages of an increasingly ordered world. Um, the origins of these do not lie entirely in a reaction to a globalizing and integrating system, but there are elements of that in each of the three. So of course the first we have in the 19th century, the initial run at an effort at an international order in the modern era, the Vienna system, the concert of powers, when the great powers of the era band together 
in the wake of the Napoleonic Wars to say we can't let that happen again. We have to coordinate our ambitions and our activities to try to avoid future wars. And that lasts in the estimate of some historians, some glimmers of it last all the way to World War I. It begins to break down really starting about 1850 through the Crimean War and afterward, but it lasts very significantly. The League of Nations, after World War I, when you have a similar lesson learned, becomes the idea of uh, an order to make World War I the war that ends all wars and is more focused, mostly focused, on the issue of peace. And then our post-war order, the post-war international order, the liberal international order, by far the most extensive and institutionalized of the three, with international governance structures that have more authority than was ever contemplated before. All of these represent efforts by individual nation states to create this sort of international governance in an increasingly integrated system to fulfill their own interests. Two big historical obvious lessons come out of this. One is, that orders tend to emerge in the aftermath of a major war. That is the time when the major powers are justified in making the kind of painful sacrifices of sovereignty, compromises necessary to create an order. But then the other lesson is they tend to decay over time. And in the first two cases, obviously, the decay of the existing order produces a new war. So that is one of the fundamental questions we face today. In the current moment of globalization, are we at the beginning of a period where the post-war order is beginning that slide into the historical pattern that we have seen before? Now, another major lesson that I draw out of this, and much of this is based on a two-year study we did at RAND on the future of the international order, a lesson that I personally draw out of this is that orders are really grounded in and require for their legitimation some kind of fundamental paradigm or narrative. They need a story that they can tell to national leaderships and elites and also populations with the balance between the two changing over time, right? That justifies the sacrifice of sovereignty and the other steps that are taken. Now, those narratives have been very different between the three. In the Vienna system, of course, it's a fairly conservative narrative where you have monarchies banding together to, in a way, stifle the rising sense of democracy in Europe and beyond. The League of Nations is arguably, in fact, the weakest of the three, where you have an effort to avoid future wars, but it can never really resolve problems of colonial ambitions and democratization and other kind of disputes. And of course, the United States is off the bandwagon almost from the beginning, when the US Congress won't endorse the US joining. The post-war order has by far the most well-established, and in particular after 1989, universal of these narratives, one based on economic and political liberalization, on democratization to a certain degree, on global economic integration, sovereignty, a whole range of the norms that underwrite this post-war order. The problem is the revolt against globalization that we are seeing is a revolt against precisely that narrative. And this is the story of all of these orders, which is that eventually the underlying paradigm begins to fragment for various reasons, and you have a revolt against it. And today, that is exacerbated by the fact that the post-war order's material benefits and progress of measurable outputs has slowed. If you look at it in terms of the degree to which countries in the world are globalized by one common measure, levels of trade integration, percentage of, of countries and peoples in democracy, and the amount of conflict, internal and external, significant progress up until the 2000s, and then a leveling off, and in fact now a backsliding on measures of course of trade, democratization, conflict. So the perception that this narrative and order is bringing benefits for a whole range of reasons, of course the internal debates around populism, but also in terms of the outputs that the system is producing, the benefits are beginning to ebb. And then that leads to the fundamental dilemma and conflict of the globalization era, one that we are all very familiar with. It is nothing new. It is the basic dynamic in all the treatments of this, from Fukuyama's End of History to Clash of Civilizations to Lexus versus Olive Tree, is that essential collision between the demands of global governance, the requirement for authority, the impositional effect of what amounts to an almost imperial global force, against the need for this fundamental reservoir of human solidarity and collective membership, the nation state, to assert some kind of independence in this sphere. 
Bridging that dilemma is the challenge of the revised narrative that we need. And I would submit that we are only beginning to think about what that actually looks like. Some of the reactions that we see now are extreme and xenophobic, not all of them, but some of them. We need a more inclusive, responsible, pragmatic, new way of thinking about this, but one that does not ignore this dilemma. Some of the advice as well that we hear is to merely double down on the existing patterns, rules, and norms, and make it clear to everyone that they have no choice but to get on the globalization train. That period, I think, is past, and an effort to merely double down without generating new ideas that can form a revised paradigm for globalization 4.0 will only exacerbate the backlash that we're seeing. When we looked at, in our study, hallmarks of a decaying order, we found two overwhelming and consistent themes. One is some degree of socioeconomic and sociopolitical distress on the part of key member countries, if not most member countries of the order. So a classic example of this, Great Depression, 1930s, that sort of socioeconomic situation that provides the basis for nationalist, populist, all sorts of outrage. And in fact, when you see in the uh, discussion in the World Economic Forum Risks Report, a chapter on an age of anger, right? We see the similar sorts of echoes today. And then the second consistent hallmark or signpost of a decaying order is the defection of one or more of the great powers who decide that their ambitions can no longer be satisfied within the existing order. The US-China debate today kind of distills a lot of aspects of that question, not only for one, but for both of those great powers, as we see right now. And there are others that may be wavering. There are other uh, signposts that, that you typically see as an order begins to decay. Significant domestic interests in the member state turning against the basic narrative or paradigm of the order. Changes in personalities that fragment critical sets of relationships that were upholding the old order. This kind of political turbulence within member states and significant new patterns in politics. That all, of, co of course, sounds very familiar. So to me, a historical glance offers us two big lessons. One is, arguably, at least from a geopolitical standpoint, we stand at a very perilous time. There is significant evidence that if we take the historical pattern seriously, and we may say that we are actually divergent from that, that the post-1945 order is something fundamentally different from those earlier ones, Nuclear weapons deter war. The level of integration is so much greater. The response to the 2008 financial crisis was radically different than the 1930s and shows the countries appreciate the need to keep the system going. There is evidence that we are in a somewhat different world, but the lessons of history, I think, shouldn't be ignored. And they suggest that if we are at the beginning of the fragmentation of this order, the next decade or two could be extremely dangerous indeed. And then the second lesson of history to me is that Again, we need a new fundamental narrative. All too often we think of the problem today as technocratic tweaks to specific institutions or clever policy solutions to individual problems. To me, if history is any guide, that's not enough. That we can tweak all of that around the edges. But if there is not a revised, not entirely new, because many of the norms and values of the existing system are entirely relevant, if there is not a revised, approach to a fundamental narrative, we may not be able to save the existing order. And I think that's what so many groups, individuals, scholars, thinkers are groping toward in many countries, ranging from you know, Brazil to the United States, certainly, to Europe, to parts of Asia. We're not close to getting there yet. And I think that's the fundamental challenge we face if the history of globalization is any indication. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Professor Gopinath, would you like to, uh, would you like to respond? Uh, yes, I would. Uh, I'd also like to first apologize for my voice and recovering from a bad cold. Um, a couple of points. So my first point, uh, and I agree with much of what Mike said. Uh, so the first point is to recognize that backlashes against globalization don't happen in a vacuum. They are a response to rising economic discontent. So it's interesting to compare what happened uh, during the Great Depression, this is uh, 1920s, 1930s, to what's happening now. Just like now, even back then, there was rising inequality. 
there was a growth in what we call global imbalances, which we talk about now. So the global imbalances are now about the, are about the US on net buying more from the rest of the world than the rest of the world buys from the US. Back in the 20s and 30s, it was reversed. It was the US that was selling more to the rest of the world, and it was the UK that was buying more from the, U from the US. So what was the US and UK back then is now the US and China with, with roles flipped. Uh, so this is a discontent that comes, uh, that it's a common uh, feature of it. Um, you also had at that time uh, an increase in market power of firms back then as you see now. So there are these similarities. Uh, and usually in response to that, it ends up with new institutions being created, uh, the International Monetary Fund being one of those. But it's important to highlight, I mean, Mike raised many of the concerns with the system that, that need to be fixed, but it's also important to highlight the many benefits of the system. The benefits of the system, there are many aspects of globalization. There is the, uh, the economic climate, uh, even within economic, there is trade, there's capital flows, there's migration. Uh, I'm going to talk about, because we don't have time to go over everything, I'm going to pick one and I'm going to pick international trade because that's on, on top of a lot of people's mind. So when you look at international trade and if you look at what uh, has happened post-1945 and particularly since 1980, is you've had the biggest decline in global poverty uh, alongside this increase in integration in trade in the world. And that's something that has to be recognized. Uh, there's been an improvement in uh, livelihoods for many, many uh, people. There's been an increase in productivity, an increase in efficiency. So there are many benefits to it. But yes, the system doesn't work perfectly. So that comes to my second point. My second point is that you know, even at the, at, at the end, we create the perfect order, the best possible, the most fair uh, system. Uh, it is inherently a system that creates winners and losers. Uh, and the reason, I'm, why is that? It's the same as technology. Whenever there is new technology, uh, as we have to worry about in terms of artificial intelligence, there are people who win and there are people who lose. It's creative destruction. So even the best possible order uh, in terms of internationally set order is going to have its limitations. And so what it will need is that it will have to be supplemented with domestic policies that address the, the fact that there are some people who lose in this process of globalization. Um, I'm happy to go into possible solutions, but I think I'll wait for later. Maybe we'll work our way around to those. Yeah. Professor mm -hmm. Chang, would you like to respond yeah. to Mike's? Uh, Mike's? Yeah, I, I will perhaps share my thoughts on um, uh, how we view the previous globalization, or globalization 3.0, and draw some lessons for our new globalization. It's also built on your uh, time frame. Now, uh, concerning these um, lessons, uh, let me try to cut the long story short, simplify the story. As we all know, China is uh, now considered one of the major beneficiaries of the last round of globalization. And why so? Uh, so I try to uh, make distinction between, perhaps oversimplified, the Western approach <laughs> and the Chinese approach to globalization 3.0. Uh, the Western approach, I think, is uh, uh, rather ideological. And uh, to a certain extent, zero sum game. And um, let's look at the previous globalization. Actually, it's not only economic, but it's also political. It's about liberalization, marketization, privatization, democratization, the list goes on. And uh, behind this is this philosophy of end of history thesis of Fukuyama and this uh, 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 neoliberalism <coughs> focusing on the market. Uh, now we see the problem of huge gap between rich and poor, both within many countries and across the world. And then we see the rise of the Brexit and the Trump. 
And of course, before that, you have the collapse of Soviet Union, uh, which was, of course, great victory for many in the West, they believe so, but for many people in Russia, it's a sad story. Now, the Chinese adopted a very different approach. When this round of globalization, the previous round, came in, uh, Deng Xiaoping said, uh, this was good, and we should embrace it. But he said, we embrace only economic liberalization, not the political one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's crucial. Yeah, that makes all the difference. And then within this economic liberalization, his team, Chinese leaders, embraced almost everything, <clears throat> but with certain exceptions, especially the liberalization of the capital market. Otherwise, China would have fallen into a financial crisis. So with the passage of time, we can see uh, this approach has worked for China at least. Now let's look at the, another case of globalization, the internet revolution. Yeah. When that occurred in the West, in the United States, Chinese saw this as a good opportunity. <coughs> Again, Deng's approach, no, it's not, not the Deng Xiaoping's approach, but the approach of his, uh, his ideology, his thinking, that we should maximize advantages and minimize its disadvantages. So when this internet revolution occurred, the typical Western approach, especially American approach, is to have it politicized as a tool in the name of the freedom of speech, freedom of information, to encourage what we call color revolution, Arab Spring, and the list goes on. And China rejected that categorically. That's important. Yeah. We said, I said in day one, Arab Spring will become Arab Winter. I had debate at that time in 2011 with Fukuyama. Fortunately, my prediction turned out to be right. And uh, uh, Chinese view this as a, a double-edged sword. Mm. Yeah. Now we all see this problem, even in the West. Supporters of Donald Trump do not watch CNN or read New York Times. They use Facebook, they use Twitter. Mm. And, uh, and you have this scandal of uh, uh, Facebook and uh, Cambridge Analytica uh, and other scandals. I do not mean the Chinese approach is the perfect, but at least uh, the Chinese approach is also a line of Deng Xiaoping thinking. It's called people's livelihood oriented. The internet should also serve to make people's life easier, convenient, comfortable, in accordance with the wish of the vast majority of Chinese people. Internet is the best tool to fight poverty, the best tool to uh, th that's the one reason why now we have this mobile phone revolution. You have uh, one mobile phone, you can do everything. Mobile payment in China today is 70 times of the United States. If you look at the internet world today, what have problem with China's internet governance? It's not perfect, but today you have to say in the internet world, there are two universes. One is English, one is Chinese, mm -hmm. basically. If you look at the 10 internet giants, China occupy four. Yeah. So any lessons from uh, this, uh, from my biased Chinese view? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, first, I think we should listen to the people, really. What are the real demands of most people, rather than elite? Second, depoliticize it. De-ideologicalize it, if we can use this term. Uh, Third, the Chinese method is with what we call people's livelihood orientation. Try to make life better. Life both in material terms and in spiritual terms. And then win-win rather than zero-sum game. Concerning this uh, uh, new industrial revolution, uh, of course, in the West, if you, I read this article uh, in Financial Times yesterday, it's about so-called surveillance state in China. I think it's so shallow, so many innovations going on. It's, it's, a, it's a revolution of the revolution. You dismiss it on ideological grounds. I think it's so stupid, you know. Really, you will miss a lot. I can leave this guy in darkness. You know. You'll come back to China. If I were a Financial Times, I would really go to China, go to different you know, uh, sites to see how people are making creative work there. 
Mm. We believe it's a double-edged sword. And uh, this Chinese uh, view, uh, we experience agricultural civilization. We experience industrial civilization. Now we're experiencing information civilization. It's a qualitative different. From my humble Chinese view, many in the West still look at this information civilization with the eyes of industrial civilization. As a result, everything goes wrong. We must be extremely da -da -da -da, very nervous. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, with Chinese approach, as China reform opening up, the approach is we embrace new things openly, courageously, but with certain cautions. And for whatever problems, surveillance state, uh, privacy, you also have a solution even in technical terms. New technology can find solutions. Mm -hmm. Blockchains can find solutions for this. So we, we are open to new ethics, you know, open for discussions. And, and finally, you know, I think indeed, uh, because Mark mentioned the possibility of this uh, in the transition period, all kinds of conflicts, especially between China and the United States. We're also concerned with that, because this particular moment of history, you have three trends in one, we have three in one. One is the rising power versus status quo power. <coughs> you have the new industrial revolution, and you have the shifting world order. In the past, any one of this were lead to war. Now, three in one. So re many reasons could cause conflicts. But fortunately, again, with my Chinese bias, China is not a country. Uh, we don't have this uh, warmongering tradition. We are a country with the tradition to build great wars, to defend, not to. Yeah. When China became the world's, uh, when the United States became the world's largest economy in 1890s, the uh, United States launched war against Spain and occupied the Philippines and Cuba. Mm -hmm. When China became the world's largest economy by purchasing the power parity, PPP, uh, by IMF's uh, calculation uh, five years ago. China did not do that. Mm -hmm. In terms of China military might, we can take back all these South Sea China islands, I, what we call occupied islands, overnight, 24 hours. But we did not do that. We prefer negotiate the solution. If we want to fight a war with the United States, why we bother to buy over $1 trillion of treasury bonds? We will not do that. <laughs> So if not, unless you still want to launch a war, there'll be no war. Yeah. Thank you. Well, that's a, that's a, that at least is a very optimistic note. Uh, <laughs> perhaps, perhaps. We will, we will listen to Mike Pompeo this afternoon, maybe. maybe. Um, but out of this initial exchange, it seems to me, crystallizes uh, a, 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 an extraordinarily interesting juxtaposition. Mm. Because Mike's opening gambit was, there can't be an order without a story. There can't be an order without a narrative. There can't be an order without an ideology. Story, narrative are just polite words for ideology, exactly. I would submit. Uh, Professor Zhang's statement is that China's commitment to globalization 3.0, which I take to be the 1990s globalization. 2.0 is 1970s globalization. 1.0 is 19th century. Anyway, China's approach to globalization 3.0 is distinctive precisely because it's unideological. Now, how do we square those two positions, right? Does that imply that, in fact, may be buried in the Chinese position there is an ideology which is more that of a humanism? In other words, it's basic needs that need. We need to listen to the people. It's that basic human needs kind of approach, which is an ideology. It's just a minimal one. Or are we facing the prospect of a new order with, which is stripped down in ideological terms? And in that case, Mike, can we even conceive that? Or do you suspect that China actually has an ideology as a new hegemon and will impose it. And then my question to Professor Gopinath directly out of this is that for many people, of course, looking in, the IMF used to be a source of ideology. And the IMF used to be the driver of the Washington Consensus. You were one of the institutions which defined things like capital mobility as standards to which all states should aspire, a very clear kind of vision there. And it seems to me that an institution like the IMF in this new world in which perhaps one order is fragmenting, a new power is emerging, which defines itself as pragmatic, has a particularly interesting job 
to negotiate. Anyway, that's my, the thoughts that were immediately triggered. Maybe, Mike, you want to start by responding, and we'll get one round, and then we'll open yeah, it up. So, th so that's a very, very uh, fascinating discussion of, of China's perspective, and I think it raises, as you say, exactly the issue. I mean, one possible answer, as you've said, to, to, to the problem of the order today is, don't overestimate this. This is a problem of domestic economic policies. Mm -hmm. And if a number of states start to get those a bit more right, then the rebellion calms down and no one will be talking about the collapse of the order anymore. So that's a very real possibility. I would add actually another level of complexity to the US-China piece, which is the nationalism piece. I think it's no surprise we're seeing a lot of discussions these days about a positive nationalism or progressive nationalism or nationalism with a good name because I think that any narrative has to also strike this balance that allows for the fact that peoples in many countries have said, maybe it's because globalization passed a certain threshold, combined with some economic and political challenges, uh, we want to take back some aspects of what it means to be our nation that we think we were losing. So I think, without giving in to the negative xenophobic aspects of, of nationalism, that any new ideology has to strike a somewhat different balance between what amounts to a global imperial force, let's be honest, and, the, and at the same time, the US-China differences. So obviously since 1989 at least, the ideology of the world order has been liberalization. And there are many in the West who for very good reasons have no interest in giving that up and continue to believe that whatever the perturbations, the end of history notion that people everywhere deserve essential human rights and some form of democracy is still true. So given all of these complexities, and I didn't even begin to try to do this obviously, if any of us were to start to make a list of what are the components of a sustainable ideology that could underwrite globalization 4.0, mm -hmm. that marries the US-China differences that does not abandon the value of the market approach that's been part of the current order, that gives voice to n positive nationalist sentiment, what would we start to put on that list? <laughs> and I think one of the things that concerns me is I think we're in a little bit of a race against time because that dialogue, of course, is underway. I mean, in the emerging US political debate coming to 2020, you begin to see aspects that but can we get far enough along in that debate where we begin to get consensus on some of what those things are before the thing tumbles downhill and the US and China are in a cold war? That's our challenge. Uh, I enjoy the comments very much. Just to be clear, whenever a new order gets set up, it is always meant for the benefit of humanity <laughs> and for a better world and a better society. So in 1945, when you had the new, uh, post 1945, when you had the new institution set up, <clears throat> of which the IMF is one uh, of the Bretton Woods system, the purpose was to prevent countries going to war, to have economic cooperation, to make sure that people have better lives. Now, you know, we can disagree about the path to it, but the goals were always the same. So I don't think there's any disagreement there. Uh, in terms of the ideology that this has to be for humanitarian uh, benefit. Um, what happens over time is that uh, we revisit the different forms that globalization takes, and we, we re-examine what works and what doesn't work. Uh, and so one of the changes that has happened with, uh, with the fund uh, is with regards to capital flows. There's a clear recognition of the fact that capital flows, uninhibited capital flows, are not necessarily uh, good for all countries and at all times. Uh, and so that has been, that is uh, something that, that we recognize. Now to come back to the question on, on the trade side, but just to be very clear, I'm not saying that the international policy is, works very well and it's all about domestic policy. I think both need to be addressed. So on the, on the international policy side, I think what has worked quite well uh, with the WTO, with the World Trade Organization, is the dispute settlement when it comes to very kind of very overt trade-related uh, measures like tariffs, like quotas. Uh, in those cases, there is a system in place uh, to address it. 
I think what the WTO and these institutions do less well is for the policies that take place within the borders of a country, so inside a country, uh, and the impact that has on protectionism. And so it is a very good question to be asked and has to be explored more, is that when countries use subsidies to protect their industries, and it's not, and this is not specific to any particular country, there are many countries in the world, in the developed world, in the developing world, that use uh, industrial policy to favor their industries. Uh, how do we react? How does the international order react to that? And I think it's in that second space that we haven't done as well. We've done quite well in the kind of more in-your-face tariff uh, situation. The other point is in terms of domestic policy. And in domestic policy, I think we have to acknowledge uh, that we all came to this very late. Uh, we, we waited for a lot of discontent to build up before saying, that, okay, well, we needed to fix, uh, fix domestic policies. And so what we need to do immediately is to, is to make sure that we are there when, when the problem uh, arises because we know that when we ignore it, it's no longer a problem of just a job and an income, but also it becomes a problem of health, the opioid epidemic in, 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 in the US. So it, it morphs into a much bigger problem. Uh, and the solutions we have are a, a bit piecemeal in the sense that yes, we have treated, we have assistance programs to reskill people, um, but that we would need a more holistic approach because usually uh, when you want to fix uh, problems of, of people losing jobs that are related to globalization, you ha they might have to move, so they might, the mobility is required. For that, you need to have policies for housing, for credit, besides policies for education and skilling. Uh, and, to the la and just one last point about, <clears throat> you know, uh, is this all gloom and doom for the current globalization system? I just want to tell you that, you know, we have, not we, there's a Pew Research Center that has surveys uh, every year asking people their views on globalization. Uh, and it's very interesting. It moves so closely with the economic cycle. <laughs> so between 2014 and now, when we've been going around the world talking about the issues with globalization, there's actually been an improvement in sentiment mm -hmm. towards globalization and trade particularly. And why is that? It's because the world economy has done better in the last five years than in the past. So, you know, let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater is all I'm trying to say. Um, but that, that said, we certainly need to have a vigorous debate on the next set of policy issues. Professor Zhang. Yeah, I'll make two points. One is concerning uh -huh. this um, uh, a new narrative uh, which requires certain uh, consensus on uh, certain values, which I agree. Uh, yet, I also think uh, uh, we have to understand big background. Uh, we did a study years ago concerning this issue of values. Um, if you look at a survey, uh, uh, you find interesting uh, different priorities in values. Let's say we have universal values, certain values all people should adhere to. Yet, we find that United States, uh, the top one in the list, in the priority list, is freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. yeah. Although, personally, having been to the United States many times, it's a politically correct country. Mm -hmm. To be honest, uh, in a politically correct country, it's difficult to be have genuine freedom of speech. Yeah, that's my uh, note. Huh? <laughs> uh, in the Chinese world, I mean broad sense, including all those who use chopsticks from Singapore to Hong Kong, uh, of course, Chinese mainland, the number one in the list is always public order. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is crucial because as a large country, China in its modern history experienced long and period of chaos. If you ask Chinese which problem you are afraid of most, they will tell you Luan, chaos. Yeah. From the Sino-British Opium War in 1840 up to four decades ago, throughout this 140 years, China's longest period of continued stability 
for the whole country as a whole was nine years. Mm -hmm. And then it was interrupted, either by domestic uh, peasants uprising, mm -hmm. or by foreign aggression, mm -hmm. or by this kind of ideological yeah, crazy. And uh, uh, so that's a way to help understand. Uh, yes, we all cherish certain values, but in terms of priorities, different people mm -hmm. uh, play different priorities. Second, no, yes, I drew lessons from the globalization 3.0. Uh, yet, I think perhaps we can submit this view. Uh, China's initiative for uh, Belt and Road, uh, this BRI, uh, is a, n a new type of globalization in many ways. It's based on a new narrative. It's called the, I call this consultative democracy. Uh, discussing together, building together, benefiting together. As China now is the largest trading partner for over 130 countries, so whether the United States join it or not, we hope the United States will join this initiative. If for all kinds of reasons, the United States will wait for the government shutdown or whatever <laughs> to, to get over, whatever. China will drive this anyway. I was in Germany last month, and they have a lot of uh, uh, criticism of the BRI. Yet we have uh, opinion surveys uh, uh, in what we call BRI countries. Uh, most countries, especially developing countries, are very positive about this. Mm -hmm. So I said to my German colleague, I said, uh, don't miss this opportunity. It's a great opportunity. I said, you missed one uh, about 15 years ago when China and EU forged really strategic partnership, a signed agreement. They decided to build together this uh, Galileo plan, uh, uh, European's GPS program. Mm -hmm. yeah. But China even put money into it, a lot of money. Mm. Then European began to uh, set all kinds of restrictions for Chinese partners. So China said, let's do it alone. Now China's Beidou system is way ahead of this Galileo system. Mm. 10 years ahead at least. So I said, same with BRI. We will do it anyway, because most countries, most participants support it. Mm -hmm. I hope Europe will join this. It's mutual, it's really based on win-win, you know. And um, so trillions of uh, deals, of business deals, opportunities are available. You do want to have it, that's your choice. But we'll do it anyway, yeah. Mm. So, so that's my point. Well, thank you for this great opening round. Maybe what we might do now in our last 20 minutes is take some questions to further stimulate and enrich discussion. <coughs> Maybe if you can, when you ask your question, just in one sentence, introduce yourself so we know who we're talking to. Uh, do, I have a, do I have a first question? Lady here in black. With the, there we go. Um, I actually just have some comments. Would Could that you be okay? just introduce yourself? Sorry. Uh, sure. Um, my name is Bing Song. I work for Bogorim Institute China Center. Um, in fact, I think, uh, you know, when we talk about the uh, finding a new narratives for the new uh, uh, globalization, I feel a lot of discussions we're having is a little like try to fit a square peg in the round hole. So um, when, when, when uh, Mr. Bazar, you're talking about the liberal uh, values and democracy, you think any nation or any, any, any individuals will, 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 will you know, uh, warrant a certain degree of that. In fact, <coughs> if you look at the China's development in the past th uh, 30 years, China may not use democracy or freedom, that kind of uh, uh, slogans, but you, when you look back, and then the, the, the degree of freedom, you know, 30 years ago versus now, it's just, it's not in the, you know, it's not in the same league anymore. So, okay, we have a freedom to choose employment, travel, and, um, you know, um, in fact, there's a lot of freedom in the uh, social circles and then not in official media. I think the Western media tend to focus on the official media. Mm. Indeed, there's not, in, not, not uh, you know, freedom there, but in the social circles, there's plenty of freedom. So my point is, when we look for the um, common grounds, rather than looking for the same value, that, you know, you should look on the underlying things. I mean, same, same concepts. You should look at the underlying kind of uh, uh, um, um, thinking or thoughts. Let's say, let's say when, when we think about um, 
<laughs> when we think about democracy, perhaps the US um, folks mostly focus on one man, one vote system. You focus a lot more on the process. But in fact, the underlying concern is responsiveness to people's needs, mm -hmm. okay? So US, you may use the one man, one vote system to accomplish that. But the Chinese government has its own ways of, of dealing with that. We can see the track record in the past uh, 30 years. And also, in fact, Chinese government doesn't really just make up its mind and push the button and then push the, uh, the laws without consulting. And, and, and actually, uh, Professor Zhang talked about consultative uh, process. The lawmaking, rulemaking process in China is very elaborate and involves a lot of deliberations and consultations and stuff. It's not at all sort of just push the button by the central uh, authorities. So my point is maybe we're talking at different levels. Mm -hmm. And then that's one point. Second point I want to make is... Maybe you could make this one brief so that okay. we, can, we the, have time really for Okay, sure. Really brief. This one is, in fact, you know, we are at a, a crossroad. And I think there was a, the humanity really facing a lot of global common challenges. Frontier technologies, its impact on humanity, nuclear crisis, you know, environmental issues, and all those things is actually, it's not US versus China. Mm -hmm. And it's the humanity, the exist existential risk of humanity. So I think this is, would be the narratives, kind of narrative we should build our, uh, you know, the new globalization 4.0. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Do we have, a, do we have another uh, question here? A gentleman with a beard on the right hand <laughs> side and then the gentleman at the front. I might bundle these two so that we <laughs> get a certain amount in the room at the same time. It seems that uh, I, I'm the only one who has a beard here. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> my, uh, uh, my name is Ali. I'm the chairman of Hidayah for countering extremism. I'm from the United Arab Emirates. Mm -hmm. What I see always missing when we talk about globaliz globaliz globalization is the issue of the human values, the world values, things that will bring us together regardless of the economic challenges or the political challenges. I think we will not be able to achieve what we want in the economic side or the political side, mm -hmm. unless we promote the coexistence, unless we promote the world <coughs> values, things that will bring us together. We need more bridges related to humanity rather than walls. Do you, you. When you say that, do you think about specific projects that you have in mind? When you, because otherwise, this sounds like a very abstract and general proposition. Well, for myself, you see, you know, my, my main mission is to counter extremism okay. worldwide because I feel that this is the threat to, you, to the humanity and to the world at, as a whole, not to a certain region. This is why I want you know, to promote you know, the issue of coexistence, the, okay. the world values, the, the value that will bring us all together as human beings. This, way, this is the only way that will, or the only path that will Thank take you. us to peace and prosperity. Excellent. Thank you. Gentleman at the front here, also a man with a beard. <laughs> <laughs> well, Arun Kumar, I'm with KPMG India, and formerly an appointee in the, uh, in the Obama administration. Yeah. So my question really is about globalization. Are we seeing a move towards regionalization? Because there's been a big retreat from multilateral arrangements. And we see in Asia, for instance, the RCEP and the TPP-11 on the Asia Pacific. So are we seeing a different approach here in the evolution of globalization? So away from multilateralism towards regionalism or bilateralism? In, in fact, re, the bilateralism definitely, and yeah. I see some exceptionalism. Yeah. But the interesting point might be the regional integration. Excellent. I'm actually, I saw a forest of hands over there. I think I'm going to go there before we go back to the panel, just since time is so short. Exactly. A woman at the back. Thank you. My name is Cassie Nyon and I work for the European Commission. And uh, when we find a new narrative, I think choice for different narratives is probably uh, one of the elements to cater for. And I want to ask you a specific question about choice, which is currencies. Uh, the European Commission has recently proposed that the euro uh, could be another way to have more choice, not only the dollar as an international currency for international trade, but also the euro. So I'd like to, uh, we're rolling out consultations where we're really thinking about it, um, how to build on the 20 years of success of the euro to take it on, and I'd really like to see, uh, to have your views on that as well. Thank you. Do we have any more? Yes, gentlemen here, glasses in the middle. Thank you. Uh, Chris Giles from the Financial Times. I've never written about the surveillance state, though. Uh, the, panel, um, uh, the, the, the panel was asked to come up with a new narrative, or the question was, is there a new narrative of globalization? And we had, the, we had expressions of the need for one, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, 
and maybe there yeah. isn't a global narrative and a Chinese way is quite different from a Western way. I just want the panel at some stage to come up with two sentences that they think might be their answer to what a new global narrative is that might be acceptable around the world. That's a nice, specific challenge, which I will <laughs> feed back to the panel. We will not leave without two sentences from each of you. Yes, lady at the front here. I'm just going to really take everything we can, and then we'll just go back to the panel for answers, because these are questions that demand substantial answers. Uh, could the panel elaborate a bit on Gita's point about unrestricted capital flows? Can you have any more just version of globalization without addressing that? And mm -hmm. if that has to be addressed, with what values in mind? Mm -hmm. Excellent question, because when you restrict, what for, what are the priorities in restricting? Yes, gentlemen here. I'm Jacob from Industry Foundation India. Uh, my question is, what does globalization for have to offer from, you know, in, in, for inclusion, you know, both economic and things like gender, or will it just remain a domestic policy issue? I think at that point, we might have enough to be fill <laughs> our time. <laughs> just might have enough. Who would like to, who would like to start? Mike? Yeah. So uh, just to finish up, I want to emphasize as strongly as I can that as I'm thinking about this, as I'm talking, I'm talking analytically and empirically, not normatively. Mm -hmm. So I specifically chose not to try to offer a vision of what this should be. And I'm talking about what history tells us about what the moment we're in and what potentially to expect realistically and practically from national governments and the politics that, that nations are dealing with. So I agree entirely on the need for a world values basis and, and for sort of human security, human values to be part of a new narrative. Practically, I don't think that's enough. I think that the justifying elements, the justifying ideology of a new era of globalization has to be, has elements that are more self-interested than that for the participating states. In terms of currencies, um, I think practically, not being an economist, but practically from a political standpoint, this is another one of the challenges because the United States would be, I think, have very little interest in sacrificing the benefits of the, the leading reserve currency. So those are just examples of, I think, practically the difficulties of, of working this out. Let me just say a last word about the US-China piece. And this is only the second panel that I've, I've, or group I've sat in today, in both of them the US-China relationship has risen to the fore. And it's going to be interesting to see over the next couple of days if that is the defining aspect. And I'm not going to, we could so easily turn this into an argument about domestic Chinese policy or international approaches. I'm not going to do that. But it's instructive, I think, how easily and quickly this could turn into an argument how we could listen to each other's perspectives, begin taking issue, and have this debate. And that, again, speaks to me to the analytical and empirical risk here. Because that, certainly coming from Washington, is the trend that I see. <laughs> is that these kinds of dialogues are hardening, and that the response is, you don't apparently share my values and the values I thought the world order was about, even though in more aspects of this I couldn't get into, in 1945, it wasn't the same as it was in 1989, right? The, it was sovereignty-based and great power-based and a lot of differences. So I think that, that, to me, just illustrates the great danger of the moment. And I'm, I'm not going to, unfortunately, answer the question about the two sentences, because I don't even know if analytically we're at that point. But I will give you one example, not exactly a sentence, but a, a, an aspect of this that gets to this dispute. And it relates, I think, to the issue of, for example, responsibility to protect, which is a great example of where the value-promoting ambitions of this post-war order have come to. And I think a challenge for the United States and much of the West, but beyond the West as well, is for value-sharing and promoting democracies to figure out a way of being true to their commitment to certain democratic and inclusive values without believing that they have to enforce those on others in certain circumstances and without believing that they can't live in a shared global world with countries who don't see eye to eye on all of those. How do you square that circle? How do you get that peg to fit where the United States can say, here is our agenda for promoting liberal values, and it is an agenda that can live in a world where China will look at some of our freedom of speech values or other things and say, it's not quite for us in the same way, and where we will face circumstances where 
the oppression of human rights is much more severe and the temptation will be to say, we cannot allow that to go on anywhere, we must be interventionist about this. That is a great example of, and I don't have the sentence that, but that's one of a few dilemmas, um, and, and just to sort of finish up, you use the right word. All too often in globalization 4.0, I think we think of the challenge as technocratic institutional design or innovative policy design. I think the challenge we face is ideological, is unavoidably ideological, which is so much harder, <laughs> as the discussion today is, is revealing. And it is gonna take a level of maturity and commitment to, to, to sort of geopolitical engagement mm. that it would be remarkable if it happens. Don't you also think, just very briefly to interject, when you say my account <laughs> of this is not normative, it's historical, part of the problem is that the history itself is a history that is so divided. Well, you know, the history of the right. Vienna Congress, one slide, is also the moment of Professor Zhang's opium wars, right. in which we were ordering Europe and disordering Asia. Right. And on the basis of that, that history, we're then going to project forward some vision, because that's what history tells us, is how you make orders. But the history itself is a history, essentially, the 200-year history of modern history that we take as the relevant data set, is a history of China's disturbance and Europe and America's overweening power. Anyway, that was just a... Made, so, made even worse by the fact that, speaking for the United States, yeah. we are terrible at understanding the fact that what we appreciate about the world is our version of yeah. the history. Yeah. We are convinced that it is the universal version. So there's no escape there. The ideological or the perspectival p p p goes all the way down. Right? Exactly. That even at what we think of as being the facts of 19th century history themselves are carry with them the rumbles of this complex. So enough. Right. So who would like to... Yeah. Maybe, maybe we should take these questions of capital flows, currency. There, there are maybe two sentences there that uh, you can distill out for us. OK, quickly. Um, so yes, I think um, I, too, speak from the point of analytics and empirical work. Um, <clears throat> and you know, statements about values I think are important, but I guess as a trained economist, it's easy for me to think in terms of uh, what we've learned uh, from uh, policy choices that have been made in the past. <clears throat> so uh, to the question of currency, uh, I think that's a very important one because I've worked on it a lot. Um, there is uh, a clear dominant currency in world trade and world finance, and that's the US dollar. Uh, if you look at most countries who trade, and even if they're not trading with the US, the dollar is their currency of invoicing, it's a currency of settlement, it's a currency of payment. Um, and interestingly, I mean, this is true not just for uh, you know, developing countries, but even for countries whose currencies are reserve currencies. So for instance, if you look at Japan, uh, when Japan sells to the US, 80% of what Japan sells to the US is invoiced in dollars. And when Japan buys from the US, 100% of what Japan buys from the US is invoiced in dollars. So <clears throat> it is a, a very stark asymmetry. But this is not new. This is how it's been in the past, too. So in the past, it was the British pound. This was pre-First World War I. Now it's the US dollar. It's always been one and at most two currencies that have shared the global stage. Um, <clears throat> so without going into what benefits that, that put, I think that's a whole different session altogether. Um, the question is what about the euro? And what, what do we see uh, as the prospects of the euro or the renminbi <laughs> being a, a currency in the, in, uh, to dominate in the future? What we've seen is interestingly, uh, in the last decade post the financial crisis, euros, there was, while there was pre-financial crisis an increase in the euro's role, as a global currency, that came down quite significantly post the financial crisis. Okay? So for a currency to become a dominant currency, it has to dominate both in international trade and in international finance, because the two complement each other. So uh, for the renminbi, while China is another biggest uh, trade, has the biggest trade share in the world, even if the renminbi gets used a lot in international trade, if it doesn't become a financial currency, it will be very hard for, that, for the renminbi to become the dominant currency of the world. So there are many challenges to it. 
Um, on capital flows, I, by the way, this voice is horrible, but I'm going to go. You're doing well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so on capital flows, I think, oh, I think the question was for others, but I'm going to speak to it. On capital flows, it's absolutely true that uh, there are huge, there's a lot of volatility associated with capital flows, especially to developing countries, uh, and to push for kind of completely uninhibited capital flows, uh, I think is a, was a mistake uh, that we've rectified uh, at this point. Uh, <clears throat> to the point of regional integration, uh, I think that is important, but it is not a substitute for you know, globalization more broadly. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm going to stop at that because I don't think I need it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll just come back to Mark's point in a way to answer some of the questions. Concern this uh, global narrative based on a certain consensus on democracy. Uh, that's fine. But I really, to be honest, you know, are you sure you can convince the American public or your <laughs> leaders at this moment, your argument? I was watching CNN this morning, you know, uh, uh, Madame Pelosi was saying, the war is about immorality. We cannot agree, you know. So it's a life and death fight. I don't know how you can make sure that democracy will work. <laughs> and if we have to have a democracy as a, a part of the uh, common values, then we have to agree through negotiations on the definition of democracy. Mm -hmm. It's only about American-style democracy. No, <laughs> no way. <laughs> we'll reject this categorically. We're happy if you, are, if you feel good about it, you stay with it. We do not envy you, really. You stay with it. You know. Our system is not perfect, but we are thinking it's good. <laughs> it's working. And uh, because we have a long civilization, uh, China was for 2,000 years was a unified state and was under unified ruling entity we call one party system. But within this one party system, it's, it's diversity, it's, it's uh, different values from cultural revolution to opening up and reform that's shifted within one party system, far beyond the scope of the, the Democrats and uh, uh, Trump and uh, Pelosi, Pelosi, you know, so we can find a compromise. Um, I think uh, this question from Financial Times, which I read every day, <laughs> uh, humble wisdom from China. We have practiced this for four decades, working. Very simple, two words, peace and development, within China and abroad. I was in Brussels. They asked me how to solve this refugee crisis. Any Chinese advice? I said, if you want to handle the symptoms, you have this all this what a global pact, whatever. It will not work eventually, to be honest. Chinese are very blunt. I think fundamental solution is peace and development to restore peace in the region, help these countries to develop. Indeed, Europe will have tremendous interest in Africa. You look at the speed of population growth, it will be four times of the European population. So join China's BRI and we help Africa. <laughs> Thank you very much.